As Vince said, I'm Anson. I'm from Carnegie Mellon, and our paper is on making right decisions based on wrong opinions. And this is joint work with my advisor, Ariel Prakatya, as well as another PhD student named Herda Spinade. So a quick overview of the uh, structure of my talk. First, I'll go over the background and motivation as to why this problem is important and why we study it. I'll get into the model, and then I'll present our results, both theoretical and empirical, and then end with a very quick summary. So as a general background, making decisions is something that we've been trying very hard to canonicalize as something that we can prove theoretical bounds on and actually put these bounds into practice. So one way we've done that is by this recent work uh, by my advisor called RoboVote. He worked on this extensively with, for example, Nisar Shah. And essentially the goal of this is to help people make decisions, but make decisions in provably good ways. And in RoboVote, there are two types of polls. The first is something that we call subjective preferences. And this is essentially what you think of when you say, okay, where do we want to eat tonight? Where do you want to see a movie? Where do we want to go on vacation? Basically anything where there's no objective ground truth answer. There's no like one right thing you should do. So the goal in this situation is to make participants as happy as possible. Contrast this to the second situation, which is um, that of which we've turned objective opinions, where there actually is an objective ground truth or something you can kind of evaluate ex post actually deciding what you want to do. So this might seem like an unintuitive setting, but this actually occurs a lot in real life. So if you have a bunch of scientists trying to pick a prototype to build, or have a bunch of people trying to decide what stock to invest in, um, this is all stuff that basically says your goal is to recover some sort of ground truth from noisy votes for people who actually don't know the ground truth. And so in this talk, we'll be studying only the objective opinion setting. After the two actual types of polls, there are three types of output on RoboVote. The first is a full ranking, so you want to basically recover the entire set of ordinal preferences over all the alternatives. And the second set, the second type is kind of what we term the subset setting, where you can either have multiple winners or a single winner, where the single winner is just the subset of size one. And there is previous theoretical work on rankings um, done last year by my advisor, but there was no previous work prior to this on subsets. A very quick overview of the background literature on making objective opinions. The very first thing people did, this dates back to I think the 18th century um, when the Marquis de Condorcet actually like start, started thinking about this problem. Basically the first thing and intuitively the right thing to do is to look at MLE. So given a, given a specific noise model under which people vote, you want to return the single most likely ranking or subset or alternative that is likely to be correct. The downside of this is that it's very specific to the noise model and if you don't have the right noise model or can't actually fit a noise model to the votes in practice, it actually doesn't work at all. The second thing people did uh, starting in 2014 is called accuracy in the limit and this says essentially you can take a family of noise models instead of one specific noise model but you might need a you know, potentially infinite amount of data and on RoboVote you have maybe 10 to 15 votes on, at maximum per instance so this is not very applicable in practice. So the way that my advisor tried to get around this last year was by introducing something called the worst case model with Nisar Shah, who's right back there and this essentially removes all assumptions on the structure of the noise um, in the votes. So instead of saying you have a family of noise models or one specific noise model, this just says in some, at some level of abstraction you have a bound on the amount of noise in the data and that's all you know. And the votes can be adversarial subject to this bound. However, even though this is kind of like an unintuitive setting, it performs very well in practice and that's actually like the stuff that they um, put into practice on RoboVote for rankings right now. Um, the only problem is, and I'll get more into this later, but it is perhaps too pessimistic and in particular, the worst case assumption isn't actually that pessimistic, but the optimization function which they tried to um, optimize over was very pessimistic in this work. So now that we have the background down, let's move into the model. First, I have to introduce a lot of really um, basic notation. I'm sure you've all seen this before. Um, right here, I just want to highlight that in this talk, sigma will always be a ranking, pi is going to be the input vote profile, and d is going to be some fixed distance metric over the space of rankings. Um, more specifically to this model, t will be the average distance between pi and the true ranking, which I'll denote uh, sigma star. And this is basically the only noise parameter we have in the entire model. And this is going to be what we take adversarial votes uh, subject to. And also I'll introduce this thing called bt of pi, which is going to be the set of all rankings distance at most t from pi. So basically this is saying given a set of input votes pi and given this bound on total noise t, this ball of feasible ground truth 
is going to be essentially everything that could possibly be the ground truth. And you want to basically select over this ball or minimize something subject to this ball. Uh, a very quick side note on distance metrics. We used four in this paper, but I'll only go over two, which are the most kind of well-behaved and intuitive. Uh, the Kendall Tau distance is essentially saying, if you break um, a permutation into a bunch of pairwise comparisons, so let's say you have the permutation A, B, C, D, you can break this into four choose two comparisons where A is better than all the rest, B is better than the others but A, et cetera. And you essentially look at the difference in the number of pairwise comparisons that are flipped between any two rankings. Uh, the foot rule distance is a little bit more intuitive. It just says you take the displacement of all alternatives between the two rankings. And we also looked at the Cayley distance and maximum displacement, which are far less well behaved. Um, so now I'm going to run through a quick example to kind of uh, give you intuition about the structure of the problem. So let's say you have these three alternatives, so A, B, and C, and this is the space of all possible permutations over them. And let's say you have a, a vote profile. Um, pi, which is going to be two votes for ABC and one each for ACB, CAB, and BCA. And you want to pick everything within a distance, a candle tau distance of 1.5 of this vote profile. So kind of intuitively what we do is we collapse all these. You can't really do this, but just for the sake of this visual, you collapse all of them to one kind of monster point and take everything at a distance of at most 1.5 from this monster point. Um, if you actually do the calculations, you get these candle tau distances and the ball looks something like this. And the um, you can see that it's not quite a circle because A, it doesn't fit in the diagram, and B, you can't actually think of it as a circle, which we learned the hard way. But yes, just for intuition. Uh, yes? Why is it not an integer? I thought it was the number of... Oh, yes, this is um, on average to all the rankings in pi. You divide by the, the number of six, divide by six. Uh, no, you divide by the number of rankings in pi. It's the average distance ah. from a ranking to pi. Okay. Yes. Yes, and feel free to interrupt, please. Um, yeah, so one thing I have to note is that distance functions only really make sense on complete rankings. So when we're considering things like subset loss or single winner loss, you really have to have a different metric. So there's been a lot of previous work that says you should judge a subset only by the best alternative in that subset. So essentially what we're trying to do is we say for a subset z of size little z, uh, you basically say the loss is going to be the best position of any element. Uh, in the ground truth ranking. So let's say you have a subset uh, Z of alternatives B and C, and the real ranking is A, B, D, C. Uh, position, element B has position two, and element C has position four, so the loss is gonna be two. All right, uh, now that we have all the notation squared away, let's get into the actual worst case model. So as I said before, the worst case model kind of removes all assumptions about the structure of noise. It just has a bound on the total noise. And as you alluded to, Essentially, you just um, very naturally take the average of all pairwise distances between uh, things in pi and the actual true ranking and get some um, average distance that is going to be less than some parameter t. And I'll discuss how we deal with actually choosing t in practice later. It's actually very interesting and kind of hard. But for now, let's just say you actually know t. Uh, and subject to this assumption, the votes can be adversarial, but we want to satisfy an optimization objective. And as I noted before, this is going to be the ball of feasible ground truth. So before, in 2016 work, um, you wanted to minimize the maximum distance to any feasible true ranking. And this was a natural first step when looking at worst case analysis. We kind of took the worst case over the worst case, right? Uh, in contrast, this work introduces, I guess, two new things. The first is that you want to minimize the average distance to any feasible true ranking. And the second thing is we I mentioned that we extended this to subset and single winner bounds, so you want to average, minimize the average position or loss in any feasible true ranking. So to summarize, the first thing we did was um, introduce average case over worst case analysis, and the second thing we did was introduce subset and single winner bounds in this average case scenario. All right, um, before I move into the theoretical results, are there any questions about the model? Any clarifications? If you're minimizing the loss, why to feasible? Like, what happens if you minimize the total loss? Do you get much worse results? Um, wait, sorry. Like if you just use Kendall Tower. Yes. Uh, so this is for subsets and single winner? For either of them, right? Okay. Instead of minimizing overall all feasible rankings, what happens if you minimize overall rankings? Oh, so the intuition over why we do it over feasible rankings is because essentially you don't care about everything else that doesn't possibly exist. 
right? Like if you can only have um, a subset of maybe three out of n rankings that could possibly ground truth, you kind of want to sub, uh, minimize something over only these three rankings. Yes. Good question. All right. So very quickly, previous results say that if you have a bound of, let's say, t on the total noise, you can get provably within 2t, which is kind of counterintuitive. Um, and it says, like, essentially, you can do at, um, like provably twice as badly as people do on average, which is kind of um, not very, it doesn't really uh, make you feel very good, but actually does very well in practice. So we've managed to, in the average case setting, actually uh, move these bounds down by a factor of two. So it's a qualitative difference. Instead of doing twice as badly as people do on average, you can actually do as well as people do on average, and in practice, again, do much better. Um, this is, the upper bound is global for any distance metric you want, but in both cases, the lower bounds, we have to prove separately for every single distance metric, and we've shown them for all four distance metrics we do in the paper. Um, the results for subsets are a little bit different. So in the worst case, We'd never even studied this before, but in the worst case, it's very easy to construct situations in which you get a lower bound of t. So you basically get, like, even if you want to pick one uh, best person in a whole ranking, you can basically get as badly as the entire noise or the entire bound of, on noise in the entire subset, uh, at least for the Kendall Town foot rule distances and maximum displacement, actually. Um, for Kaylee, you can basically get, like, arbitrarily bad results. But in this case, we managed to uh, push down the bounds to around the square root t over z, where note in the lower bound, the z is outside the square root, and in the upper bound, the t is inside the square root, meaning there is a gap that we haven't quite closed yet. But this is very, um, this is very reassuring in that if you look at the worst case over worst case, you don't really get any provable guarantees on how badly you can do when selecting a subset, whereas in this case, you can get you know, quite natural. Oh, the size of the subset. So as you pick more elements, the bound goes down. Yes, which is quite intuitive. All right. Um, and now for uh, the second half of our results, we actually did all this in practice and looked at a data set that was collected in 2013 by Andrew Mao and collaborators, I think. Uh, all right, thanks. Um, and in the setting, there are two settings. Uh, the first is what we call dots, and you want to rank essentially four things, four puzzles by the number of dots in the four figures. And the second thing is uh, what we call puzzle, where you want to basically rate the distances of an eight puzzle from being solved. So for, as an example, let's just say I give you these things. I give you like four pictures, and I say to rank them from least to most amount of dots. Um, these, these pictures will be parameterized by a noise parameter, which is essentially the difference in the number of dots per. So in the settings, we always started with 200 dots and then went up by increments of three, five, seven, or nine. And so for each setting, there are four noise levels. Um, it's not really important like why these noise levels matter, but just know that the noise or essentially the noisiness of the data can be parameterized by exactly one number, which is very nice. Um, and each one of these has 40 trials and 20 people per trial, so we have a lot of votes, we have almost 6,400 votes. Um, so I mentioned I would get back to estimating T in practice later, and basically, high level, estimating T is very hard. The only input you have is the input profile pi, and you really can't get much information about the total bound on noise from this profile. Uh, the current implementation says you basically take the minimum average distance from any one vote in pi to all the other votes in pi, and this guarantees a non-empty ball of feasible ground truth and guarantees, like, in some sense, an overestimation of t. Um, because this is an overestimation and because our rules don't really do well when t is an underestimation because there is no real ball of ground truth to maximize anything over, um, our rules should be very robust to overestimation. In order to test this, we basically define this function, or this variable r, which measures overestimation in some sense. It's kind of hard to explain it, but this graphic will probably help. So if r equals zero, t is like the minimum possible value of t that admits a non-empty ground truth. If r equals one, t is exactly the real value of t. And if r equals two, t is something like um, t min plus twice the difference between the real value of t and t min. And in our experiments, as in the experiments in the 2016 paper, we um, restricted R to be in the range from zero to two. So basically R measures overestimation of T, and now we can compare our results from this paper to the uh, results in the previous paper. So one thing I forgot to mention before was that the previous paper had empirical results that far outperformed all other um, aggregation rules for essentially every single noise level, every single data set. So we only compared against them because it was kind of, 
what A, what was implemented in RoboVote, and B, what had already outperformed everything else. So the part I want to highlight here is like this part after the, this precipitous drop. So as you can see, before you have an overestimation of T, basically everything is really bad because you have no feasible ground truth to optimize over and then, and then everything's kind of just arbitrary. But after that, both um, the average and the max, which is the old one, um, they both drop a lot. But as you can see, especially here, um, our new result is like a much more robust to overestimation of T. And this actually holds for not only rankings, but for subsets and um, kind of bigger subsets. Um, yeah, so the main takeaways are we have an increased robustness to the overestimation of T as we want. And this is actually pretty practical to implement in practice. Um, you can still formulate everything as an IP. You can still basically get like very nice computational complexity bounds. And we're in the process of updating RoboVote to actually have these new things. Uh, and that's a very quick summary. We have two theoretical contributions. Uh, we added an average case over worst case analysis and talked about bounds for subset selection as well as full ranking selection. And this is empirically a lot more robust to overestimation of T, even though this data set was kind of noisy, we have many more figures in the um, full version of our paper that kind of show this more naturally. Thank you.